Greetings. This is study prayer for the, gosh, 23rd day of Lent. This is the 15th of March. It's the Monday after the fourth Sunday in Lent. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, rich in mercy, by the humiliation of your Son, you lifted up this fallen world and rescued us from the hopelessness of death. Lead us into your light, that all our deeds may reflect your love through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Exodus, the 15th chapter, verses 22 through 27. Then Moses ordered Israel to set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went for three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. That, that is why it was called Marah. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? He cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and an ordinance, and he put them to the test. He said, If you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, and give heed to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will not bring upon you any of the diseases that I brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elim, where there were twelve springs of water and seventy palm trees, and they camped there by the water. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Hebrews, the third chapter, verses one through six. Therefore, brothers and sisters, holy partners in a heavenly calling, consider that Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. Yet Jesus is worthy of more glory than Moses, just as the builder of the house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that would be spoken later. Christ, however, was faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if we hold firm the confidence and the pride that belong to hope. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our reading from Exodus this morning is one more uh, tale of the journey through the wilderness of the Israelites. In this case, actually, it's quite early in the trip. Just recently have we left the Red Sea. The Song of Moses uh, takes up most of chapter 15, and that's the song that Moses sings right after uh, the crossing at the Red Sea. Um, and then, of course, the Song of Miriam. And then we get, uh, which is very important also, that Miriam was a prophetess. Um, Miriam is Moses' sister. You may have heard that the name Mary derives from Miriam. Um, so Jesus' mother is named after Moses' sister, who is a prophet. Um, you may need to know that uh, whenever you encounter toxic masculinity in the church. Uh, it's important to remember how many significant female voices there actually are supposed to be in the biblical narrative. And then when we think how few of them we hear about, um, it starts to make one wonder who has been telling us the summaries. But um, then we get to uh, Mara, which literally in Hebrew means bitter. So the water is bitter. That's why it's called Mara. It's kind of this children's fairy tale level uh, of storytelling. Uh, and, and it's very simple. The Israelites are thirsty. They've spent three days. They haven't found any more water supply. They were very thirsty. They're running low on water. They're very worried about this. They find this um, source of water um, 
presumably it's a well or a small pond or something. It doesn't really tell us, but um, he threw it into the water, so there's some sort of pool of water there. There's also some piece of wood that makes the water sweet. We also don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> presumably it's all hand-waved. Uh, I'll tell you a little ridiculous Christian gloss that is not what the text means, but that certainly later Christians would have read into it later. Um, but the purpose of this is to, is to demonstrate that God can transform, right? God can take what is not sufficient and make it sufficient, what is not helpful and make it helpful, what is actually bitter and make it sweet, right? That God can give us rejoicing in things where that where there should be no rejoicing, right? God can transform such things. And this is an example of it. That's the kind of moral of the story, if you want to use the fairy tale language of it. Um, and we hear lots of these stories about the, the exodus, uh, as well as the exile, especially in the season of Lent, a 40 day season where we are in many ways in exodus and exile from many of our common patterns, specifically so that we can be formed in that period of time, so that we can be faithful when we return to the promised land or to home or to whatever it is that we return to at the end of the season. Okay. The letter to the Hebrews, which is probably not a letter, but a sermon. We only have, this is a small section in the third chapter. And remember, this is early in the letter to the Hebrews. So this is very much concerned, right, with comparisons of Jesus to other figures. In the very start of the letter, uh, Jesus is compared to angels, and the author is trying to build a case that Jesus is better than an angel. So this, this son, the son, uh, Jesus is worthy of more glory than Moses. Remember that we already said Jesus is more important than angels. So the author absolutely believes that, but Moses is not being specifically singled out in exclusion of all the other figures. The author is trying to get us to understand how important Jesus is and turn us away from thinking that Jesus is equal to, right, Moses or to angels or anyone else. So having handled angels and the mystics who might have been talking about angelic forces, the author has moved on to those who say, oh, well, but the Torah should take precedence over anything Jesus says, right? <clears throat> An understandable instinct among Jewish folk, right? But here we have a pretty significant argument. Uh, note some of the language used to address the audience. Brothers and sisters, right? Uh, it, it would be, in Greek, it would just be brothers, but it really is a term for sibling. So that's why it's often translated brothers and sisters. It might be best now nowadays, especially to translate it for siblings to include our trans brothers and sisters and our non-binary folk. Um, holy partners in a heavenly calling. Holy partners in a heavenly calling. So there's like a high rank to the audience. You know, we're not uh, we're not taken as just mooks, right? It, this is we're we're fairly important. It's important that we all be on the same page. Consider that Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, so Jesus is pretty much the top dude was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. So in terms of them being faithful, they were both faithful. Yet, Jesus is worthy of more glory than Moses, just as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. Now, if we follow the word order here, that implies that Jesus is the builder and Moses is the house, right? For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. That confirms it, right? also confirms that we are comparing Jesus to God, not to Moses. That's the comparison that's appropriate. Very high Christology, very high uh, understanding of who Jesus is. Um, in the ancient world, uh, in the first century, there's vast debate about who Jesus was and how important Jesus was and what exactly Jesus meant. Um, Christianity uh, springs out mostly from the voices, like in the letter of the Hebrews, that basically say Jesus is God. 
in some mysterious way that we can't fully comprehend, Jesus, God's son, is also God. And there is no such thing as being more important than Jesus. That just can't work any more than you can be more important than God. Here the argument is, well, I mean, Jesus is the one who built up Moses. So how could Moses have more glory than Jesus, right? It doesn't make sense. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. So Moses is a faithful servant in God's house, okay? Christ, however, was faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if we hold firm the confidence and the pride that belong to hope. Ah, so Christ is the son in the household, Moses is the servant, and we, when we are faithful, when we hold firm, we are built into God's house as God's building. So we're the house, Moses is a servant. Christ is the son of the household, the heir, as it were. Um, so what can we take from this? One, Moses is still a part of the equation. Very important for Christians to hear, especially given the vicious legacy of anti-Semitism. We do not throw out Moses. Moses is also a servant of God, very important servant of God who was faithful in all that he did right, in, in obeying God's commandments. Maybe not everything. We talked about that last week, right, this episode in Numbers where Moses doesn't listen to God and God gets really mad. <clears throat> but Jesus is the son, okay? And that's the other thing. They're not really comparable. A son in a household doesn't run around comparing themselves to the servant. That's not a healthy relationship. They're not supposed to be the same person. They're not supposed to be in com competition. They have different roles. So that's pretty important. And that's true, of course, for Christians. Moses and Jesus have different roles, but that doesn't make either of those roles dispensable. Does Jesus deserve more glory than Moses? I mean, Jesus is the Logos, the Word of God incarnate, the Creator through whom, through whom all things exist. It's pretty hard to get higher on the food chain of priority. Um, but that's not a denigration of Moses. That's an exaltation of Jesus. And a lot of Christians don't know how to do the one without the other, right? You, as long as we keep Moses human, Moses is worthy of pretty much every praise you can give a human being. Jesus is worthy of more praise than that because Jesus is God as well as human. So that being the case, that's the case, that's what this text is trying to communicate. And then we are built up, right? Moses, the servant, makes sure the house is stable, right? And of course, testifies of the things that would be spoken later. This is um, to deal with the uh, Christian doctrine that a lot of things in the Hebrew scriptures actually point to Jesus, although we couldn't see that until Jesus came, right? And so that's kind of the idea of this revelation of Jesus that we suddenly, he opened uh, scriptures up to us. Note, of course, this is an exclusively Christian way of reading the text. Our Jewish brothers and sisters don't read the Hebrew scriptures that way, and it's understandable why they don't. Um, when they don't, um, they often see things in the text that we don't because we're too busy saying, oh, the wood that Moses threw into the bitter water was Christ. And so that means that what God is saying in this text is that Christ transforms bitterness into, into sweetness and therefore uh, suffering into joy. Like that's, that's a typical kind of Christian thing that somebody might do, right? A Jewish person would never do that because they're not looking for Jesus to be popping up in the text. Um, they're trying to take the text on its own terms and its own context from their own faith tradition, um, which doesn't mean that they wouldn't say that that is somehow a divine action or a divine symbol, but they would explain it in a different way. And it's very important to remember because the Hebrew scriptures are, and this is true, Jewish texts, right? And Peter and Paul and Jesus were all Jewish. 
So, um, yeah, uh, it's important for Christians to recognize uh, our relationship or close kinship with their Jewish brothers and sisters and how much they have to offer us in terms of opening up the scriptures that we share. That we, Christians, are only able to share with them because of Jesus, who again was a Jew. Cool. And finally, we are his house if we hold firm the confidence and the pride that belong to hope. Pride is an interesting word, rarely used positively in scripture, but the confidence and the pride uh, that belong to hope. In this case, this is about, again, clinging to God's promises, right? Confidence and pride in the promise of God and in what God has promised us, what God has done for us, who God has decided we will be in baptism, in our faith, in our Christian communities where we gather together to receive God's word. All of that, very, very important. Uh, and that is what it is to be God's house, to be built into the God community of God gathered around Jesus Christ. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And the peace of Christ be with you always. Thank you for joining me for study prayer this 15th day of March. I hope that you'll be able to join me again soon. We offer prayer opportunities three times a day, study prayer, sung prayer, and contemplative prayer in this season of Lent. If you have questions about today or any of the other previous studies, you can leave them in the description below, uh, in the comments below. You can also message me. You can uh, find my contact information on our website. Uh, You can also message me through Facebook. That information can uh, be found uh, below. You can find some of those things. You can also find out ways to support us and to join us, and you're very welcome to do so, and I hope you will. Until next time, God bless.